John here. Let me introduce you just for a moment to the audience. This is Bob Bayani. He is an independent insurance agent. You can uh, learn more about him and his company at drdisabilityquotes.com. Uh, that's his website. And he has been a long-term White Coat Investor sponsor. He's helped uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of White Coat Investors to get their disability insurance in place. And so, Bob, welcome, uh, welcome to this Facebook Live. Thanks for being on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Let's talk for a little bit, first of all, just about your company here. What, what inspired you to start DrDisabilityQuotes.com? Um, we, you know, we, um, I started my career in uh, 1989 and a part of what I did was used to visit, uh, different residency programs. Um, I apologize. We used to visit different residency programs and do in-person lectures and counsel residents and fellows on, on, um, you know, different, uh, insurance planning strategies and so forth. But as, you know, technology evolved, we saw the value of going online. And, um, you know, first step to that was setting up a website. Um, so with, with uh, you know, a, a very good uh, tech uh, uh, um, individual that I'm friends with, uh, he helped me design the website. And we, we if you if you go on the website, you'll notice that it's it's designed particularly for residents and fellows Met students, residents, and fellows. Uh, it's a wealth of information. And um, our, our target audience is, is quite frankly, med students, residents, and fellows. Um, and, and that is really, you know, who we've worked with for decades and uh, really enjoy working with. Um, and, and that was really the source of um, starting DrDisabilityQuotes.com. Cool. So for those just tuning in now, I'm here with Bob Bayani, an insurance agent. We're going to be talking about disability insurance today. So any questions you have about disability insurance, just type them in as a comment and we'll answer them as we go along. But let's start with some of the common questions that people have about disability insurance. I have run into a fair number of doctors who are like, why do I need this? I probably won't get disabled. Uh, can you share any experiences you've had, uh, you know, in the years that you've been doing this of people that you sold a policy to that then ended up using the policy that ended up disabled. Can you share what happened and what they got disabled with? Sure. <clears throat> I've, I've had uh, uh, the unfortunate, uh, um, you know, coincidence of processing three claims in the last seven months, uh, but I'll use a couple of different examples. I had a 33 year old nephrologist um, <clears throat> who was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. They found a six inch thymoma in his chest and uh, post-surgery, um, this poor fellow is fatigued. Um, most of the times, uh, you know, he has double vision, he wears prisms, um, you know, he's on a permanent disability claim. I've had three young um, attendings who, who I signed on as residents um, who've been diagnosed with early stages of MS. They're not on disability yet, but it's, it's very unfortunate to see that someone that young can have that, uh, that type of a diagnosis that early on. <clears throat> but to just talk specifically about a couple of the claims that I processed in the last um, six months, and I'm gonna stick to claims that of, of individuals that are in their 30s. You know, it, it's, it's uh, logical to expect in the fourth or the fifth decade for a lot of these issues to pop up. But what we're seeing is, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, folks in their thirties, I had a pediatric anesthesiologist uh, <clears throat> in New York City, suffered a uh, stroke on the treadmill uh, at a gym. Uh, <clears throat> I had an ENT surgeon who uh, cut open her thumb on a mixer blade um, and, and um, you know, her hand was in a cast for about three or four months another three or four months of therapy. Um, she was out for about seven or eight months and uh, <clears throat> with a 90 day wait, she still ended up collecting 15,000 a month times four or five months, um, you know, of uh, a disability payment. So it's, you know, there's no set um, profile of an individual, uh, you know, filing a disability claim. They come from all aspects of life, all ethnic backgrounds, um, <clears throat> medical specialties, socioeconomic backgrounds, 
Um, so so the, the best advice I can give a young resident is invest in a, in a, in a good disability policy, even if it's a, a small policy with a graded premium, lock in your insurability uh, is, is <clears throat> one of the first piece of advice I give residents um, and fellows, uh, even med students um, for that matter. Yeah, what a lot of people don't realize is their risk for disability, not to be disabled, but the actual risk they face is highest at the beginning of their career. When they don't have any assets, they have many, many years to go until they're 65. That's the terrible time to be disabled. It's when you're 30 or 35 or 40 years old. It's not as big of a deal when you're 55 or 60 because hopefully you have a whole bunch of assets. Um, but really early on, this is something you just have to get in place. Now let's take a, a question that's being asked by the audience. This one from Brock who asks, is there a discount for disability insurance if I sign up as a resident rather than as an attending? You wanna answer that one? Absolutely. Um, it, there most definitely is a discount uh, to sign up as a resident compared to attending. Attendings can get discounts, but their discounts are not as, um, as big or as uh, uh, quantitative as um, residents and fellows do. Um, another advantage of setting up a policy as a resident is that uh, the lab testing is waived, the financial underwriting is waived. So they really streamline the process besides offering you very low discounted rates. Uh, also, uh, one question that I get a lot is, are these discounts permanent? Not only are these discounts permanent, they even apply to additional increases that you would request as an attending when you're using your future increase options. So say you purchase a $5,000 policy as a resident, but now you're an attending and you wanna increase that to 10 or 15,000 a month, you would get that residency discount on that additional increase, even though you're an attending already. So most definitely um, the best pricing comes um, while you're in training. Now, you mentioned earlier that, that people of all different types of persuasions get disabled. But my understanding of the data is that women get disabled more frequently than men. And that's why their uh, rates are so much higher for disability insurance. Can you talk a little bit about some strategies that you can use uh, with women physicians uh, to decrease the cost of disability insurance and to get that coverage in place? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> for female applicants, traditionally, all, all the way up to this point, we've been using unisex rates um, whenever we can. And the reason why I say whenever we can is if you looked at the disability uh, or, or rather the medical population 15, 20 years ago, it was about um, 40 women to 60 men. And um, today, if you look at the, the, medical, uh, the, po the medical population, you, uh, it, it's about 60 women to 40 men. So what insurance companies have been experiencing is adverse selection. They have too many female um, applicants uh, or, or uh, policyholders on the books and not enough male. So one by one, a lot of these insurance companies have done away with their unisex rates. However, there's still a couple of very good companies, actually two of the top five that still issue unisex rates. So what effectively the point of unisex rates is that if you look at the rate difference between women and men, um, the, the rate for female applicants is about 30 to 35% higher. And what a unisex rate structure will do is it will even out the scale between male and female rates therefore making the rates very attractive for a female applicant. Um, so the, the, the biggest strategy that we use for female applicants is um, most definitely unisex rates. And I highly encourage that. And, and I actually go out of my way to see if I can locate discounts that are unisex for our female applicants. For those who are just tuning in, we're talking with this month's uh, Facebook group sponsor, Bob Bayani. You can uh, get a disability insurance quote from him at drdisabilityquotes.com. It's very easy to just send in a request and he'll get right back to you with a quote for that. Um, let's take another question here from the group. Um, the next one on disability insurance comes from Sonny, who's asking about riders, these special additions to the policy that give you additional coverages. Can you talk for a minute about which riders are important to get? 
Um, yeah, sure. Um, th that is a question I get a lot. And um, I consider the single most important writer in a policy to be own occupation writer, aka true own occupation, specialty own occupation, enhanced own occupation, regular occupation. The title differs from company to company, but effectively the writer works the same way. And effectively what the own occupation writer does is it recognizes your specialty or your super specialty and makes that your own occupation. So if as a surgeon, you developed a tremor in your hand and you could no longer do surgery, which then results into more than a 50% loss of income, you could file a claim while still working as a clinician and still be able to collect the full benefit. That's what an own occupation policy can do for you. To use a more loose example, you could go practice any other form of medicine. I have an ER doctor who, is, uh, who developed a tremor in his hand, could no longer do procedures, and he decided to become an expert witness in court. Um, he gets paid $5,000 a day just to show up to court, whether he testifies or not. And on top of that, he collects the full disability benefit. So the own occupation rider uh, is the single most important rider that any physician should absolutely must have in their policy. Now, sometimes um, this, that one sometimes that one's part of a part of the policy, part of the definition of disability, right? Isn't it only with some of the big six that it's a separate rider? It is correct. A, the the own occupation rider for let's say guardian emeritus. It's built, it's baked into the contract. It's only with some companies that you need, you can pick it or, or pick and choose the rider. Uh, for example, principal will give you the choice of a transitional own occupation rider or a true own occupation rider. But that's about the only choice. But with policies that are sold in the medical marketplace, most of the companies insist on own occupation being a part of the base contract. That is correct. So let, let's go to the next one I, I think people wonder about, which, which is uh, a residual disability rider. Uh, what do you think about that one? Sure. Residual disability rider is very critical. Um, you know, I would say it's the second most important rider after own occupation. And the reason is residual disability is also known as partial disability. So, you know, there's a saying in our industry, not all disabilities are total. And, and the reason why I say that is if you look at the claims statistically, majority of the claims for disability are partial claims. They're not total. A physician, you know, after having invested 14, 15 years of his, of his time and life um, in, in becoming a physician is going to do his or her best to work through an, uh, through an illness or an injury and only file a total disability claim if and only if they must. You know, I make a joke out of it. I always, I always tell young residents, my $10,000 a month is not going to be reason enough for you to stay home and kick it. So, you know, partial disability rider, what it does is it makes up that partial loss of income. Or if you're fully disabled and transitioning back to work, it makes up the difference between your pre-disability earnings and your current earnings. So I consider that to be a very important rider also. Okay. How about a, a COLA rider or a cost of living rider? Who should consider buying that? Who shouldn't? Um, typically cost of living rider, you know, it's, it's one of those that I recommend to younger physicians. And if I, if I get a, a graduating med student or a PGY one, two, three, even, even a resident that's approaching uh, an attending position, but is below 35, I, I advise them, look, start with the rider. God forbid, should there be a disability early on, it'll help you keep pace with inflation. But I, at the same time, I do tell them that, you know, what we should do is take a stock of your overall financial situation. And as it improves, drop the rider, save the money. Uh, on the other hand, if I do get attendings um, that are inquiring about disability insurance, I don't even quote them cost of living adjustment rider. And I explain to them that you can mitigate COLA um, by either one, getting a slightly higher benefit amount, uh, two, by using um, the automatic increase benefit rider. That's a rider that allows you to make cost of living purchases every anniversary prior to filing a claim. So there are ways to mitigate not having the COLA rider. And in, you know, if you, depending on the size of the policy, that rider can add 
30 to $100 a month on the cost of the policy. So it's definitely worth taking a second look at and ascertaining if you really need that rider. Um, yeah, a lot but of I don't, don't recommend it as a rule. A lot of people don't understand how that works. The actual cost of living increases don't start until after you make a claim. So it's not like you get paid more if you get disabled in 10 years, you get paid exactly the amount of your the benefit. Same amount. And then not for another year, really, does it increase, and usually only about 3% a year, right? And, and in some instances, zero up to 3% tied into inflation. So if you look at the past five years where inflation has been running zero to 1%, you went on claim, you probably wouldn't have even gotten an, gotten an increase. So again, it's, it's an optional writer. I let them know about it, but I don't necessarily push it. Okay. How about a future purchase option writer? That to me is a very important writer because 90% of her business comes from residents and fellows. Uh, first of all, I want to, I want to ensure their future earnings. Um, let me give you an example and I'll help you understand the importance of a future increase writer. I signed up a, a, a plastic surgery resident PGY3 for a $5,000 a month policy. He graduated and became an attending in August of 2018, about 10 months ago. And I approached him for an increase as you would be, you know, guaranteed to get that increase if he wanted it. And he told me, not really, you know, I just set up my own practice, finances are tight, let's hold off. Well, November of 2018, he called me and he told me, Bob, I'm 38 years old and I've been diagnosed with the early stages of multiple sclerosis. So right off the bat, I'm thinking plastic surgeon, working with fine motor, dexterity, cognitive skills, all of which he needs to do his job. So the first words out of my mouth were, why don't you max out your policy? I can do that. I said, yeah, you've got this future increase option rider in your policy that guarantees you an increase up to $20,000 a month, no questions asked, even if your health has changed. So that's a very valuable rider for a resident. Uh, you know, granted, they may go, you know, once they become an attending, they may go from 5,000 to 10,000. But it's nice to have the option to go to fifteen or 20000 should you feel the need to do so, or should you end up with some sort of a chronic diagnosis where there's a probability of a claim. I'd rather go on claim at 20000 a month than 10000 a month if, if I had a choice. Yeah. How about a catastrophic rider? These are new in the last few years, it seems like, where you get more money if you're really disabled and you can't do at least two activities of daily living. Is that one worth buying or should you just spend your money on buying a bigger base benefit? I, you know, let me tell you, um, this is a question I get a lot. And so let, let's, let's analyze the rider. So you've got to be enabled to do two out of six activities of daily living in order to qualify. Eating, bathing, toileting, transferring, continence, those are some of the ADLs. The issue with this rider is that 99% of the claims that come uh, for a catastrophic rider are as a result of neurological disorders that are adult onset, Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's. So to me, I don't see the value of spending 30, 40, 50, $60 a month on a rider that I may potentially never collect because my policy is gonna end at 865 while I got diagnosed with, I don't know, Alzheimer's at 72. So, so that is one rider that I see as a pure profit item that insurance companies love. Um, and, and I particularly never quote it. Now, tell me there is some genetic predisposition in your family. There's a history of neurological disorders in your family. Um, sure, I, I would never stop you from buying it, but I don't encourage um, um, getting that rider unless at, you, you as a physician feel that you must have it. Um, I, about, I rarely sell it. How about retirement? benefit rider. What do you think of those? You know, uh, retirement benefit rider is another one of those riders that, that, you know, I call it a fluff rider. And the reason is, first of all, they're only going to match uh, your contributions that you were making prior to retirement. So if you were in some sort of a state of flux and you weren't making those contributions, they're not even going to pay anything. Number mm, two I didn't know is that. Yeah. And, and some of those dollars, they go into the general account of the insurance company and not a separate protected account. And I'm not exactly comfortable handing over my retirement dollars and my retirement to an insurance company. I'd rather kind of manage that on my own. And the way, again, I would manage that is 
by buying a higher benefit. If I don't have a COLA, higher benefit. And if I don't have a catastrophic rider, a higher benefit. Uh, a retirement plan, a higher base benefit would, would adequately cover um, any additional retirement needs that you may have. Are there any other riders? Those are the only ones I know about that I hear about frequently. Are there other riders that are new on the market? Sure. There is a, it, it, this is not a new rider, but more and more companies are offering it. It's a student loan repayment rider. But what every med student, resident, and fellow should be cautious about is that this rider will only reimburse you the monthly payment that you're making. So if you purchased a rider for $2,000 a month, but you're repaying $1,000 a month, that is all they're going to repay on your behalf. That's number one. Number two is that this rider will only repay public loans. If you have refinanced or you have private loans, you're quite frankly just wasting money on student loan repayment. Interesting. Now they're, Interesting. Yes. I haven't heard that. Yes. And, and so, you know, for someone that calls me and tells me they have three, four, five hundred thousand dollars worth of student debt, what I advise them is let's get a student loan repayment writer instead of a COLA writer, because a student loan repayment writer will kick in within 90 days, whereas a COLA writer will kick in after one year. A student loan writer will repay a thousand to two thousand dollars a month whereas a COLA writer would give you small 3% increases each year that you're on claim. But then once you become an attending and you aggressively pay down your student debt, let's drop that writer altogether. So that's a strategy that I've employed for a lot of young um, med students and residents and fellows. With, uh, I think, with it's, I think it's interesting that they offer that writer because federal student loans, if you're permanently disabled, go away. You know, I don't know if that's necessarily, at least for a permanent disability, that's something you need to insure against. So you're really only insuring against a partial disability a for the few years that you still have student loans. So it, it, exactly. And, and I agree with you completely. It's one of those writers that I discuss with residents and fellows, but I don't necessarily, uh, you know, come out and, 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 you know, tell them that they have to have it just like I would a, a, a own occupation writer or a partial disability. Okay, so for those who are just tuning in, I'm talking with Bob Bayani. He's this month's sponsor of the Facebook group. Uh, he's a disability insurance expert, and you can get quotes for disability insurance from him at DR Disability. Uh, DR, let me get this right. DRDisabilityQuotes.com. You can get a free quote from him for disability insurance and jump on the phone with him and talk to him about your situation. Let's take the next question from people watching here. Um, are there federal or state limits in regards to benefit payouts for disability insurance? This comes from Peter Chang, who's in California. Uh, are there limits? I don't think there's limits necessarily no. in regard to benefit payouts, just maybe how much the insurance company lets you buy. Correct. Uh, insurance company will, will try not to let you exceed 65%, up to 65% of your income that you actually earn in a disability payout. Now, if you've purchased a policy as a resident and now you end up uh, in a position as an attending at an institution and there's a group policy in place, you could collect on both of them. And if that exceeds 65, 70, 80% of your income, they'll both pay. Um, but if you're, if you're purchasing a policy as an attending and you have a group policy, that'll limit you to how much private coverage you can get, but there's no cap as such. There's no dollar cap as such. I guess the cap would be the 60 to 65% of your income, what you earn. So someone making 100,000 a year could probably get no more than 60,000 of coverage, whereas someone making a half a million a year could get 30,000 a month of coverage, uh, 60,000 a year of coverage, meaning 5,000 a month uh, versus you know uh, higher income, higher limits. Now, I had a doctor email me today that was making over a million dollars a year. Can, can he really buy a policy that'll pay him $600,000 a year if he gets disabled? Or do the companies mm -hmm. cut it off at a certain point? They do cut it off. So you've got the way the, the insurance industry is set up is you've got layer, I call it layering. So I, I had one such individual who, you know, made a seven figure uh, income and wanted uh, a lot more coverage than what traditional coverage could get him. So what we had to do was we got him a $20,000 policy from uh, company number one. 
You got him a $10,000 policy from company number two. So your traditional sources are capped at $30,000 per month. That is the maximum you can get from a, uh, a traditional source. Throw a uh, group insurance into the mix and that cap goes up to 35,000. So what I did for this gentleman is I went to Lloyd's of London and I got him a excess policy. Um, actually his total amount of coverage was $100,000 a month. 30 from it, from uh, traditional sources, 70 from um, Lloyd's of London. But keep in mind, Lloyd's of London policy uh, is only a five or a 10 year payout. Uh, it has to be renewed every three to five years. You, you need to go through medical underwriting. So it's, it's not as simple as, oh, well, I've got you this extra, you know, 70,000 of coverage. You got to requalify for that. And the odds are stacked against us as we're getting older in terms of requalification for such a policy. All right. Our next question comes from David Scott. He's talking about not the beginning of your career, but the end of your career. Uh, what factors do you use when deciding to drop your disability insurance coverage, especially in a two income household? Two simple words, financial independence, FI. Um, you know, you reach a point in your career where, uh, you know, your mortgage is paid off, kids are grown up, uh, out of college, um, you've built a nice nest egg. Um, both the spouses are working at full steam, earning a decent amount of money. Uh, in, in a situation like that, uh, it would absolutely make sense for you to um, give up or cancel your policy, unless, of course, you have some sort of a chronic diagnosis that you're concerned could lead to a disability. Uh, but other than that, and there's no age for that. I, I know of physicians that are financially independent at 45, and I know uh, of some that become financially independent at 55. So you've got to look at your own individual situation and make a determination as to, do you have enough to live on for the rest of your life, um, it, you know, should you get disabled. Um, but what about again, this no idea settings. that two doctor households have that the other doctor serves as their disability policy and maybe they don't need a policy at all. But what do you recommend uh, yeah. to a two doctor couple uh, that comes to you? You know, I, I, I I've had, the, I, I experienced something that I want to share with with everyone is that you know when when young residents um, approach me with this concept saying, well, my fiance or my wife is a physician, so am I, and you know I'm I'm considering not even getting a disability policy, and and I tell them you know um, give this a second thought. If you get permanently disabled, what you're telling me is that your wife is going to go to work for the rest of her life and support you while you are sitting at home disabled. The whole point of having disability insurance is so that you don't become a financial burden on your spouse or your family. So uh, even if you are a two, you know, two uh, physician family, in your younger years, absolutely invest in, in, a, in a smaller policy, a cheaper policy. Uh, but have some form of coverage. And once you hit that, that true independence, uh, age 40, 45, 50, drop it, rather than not have it at all. Okay, can we talk a little bit for a minute about graduated premiums? This question comes from Jordan, who says, younger physicians are less likely to have claims. I vaguely remember you mentioning that claims might be structured so that premiums start low and increase with age. How much lower might that be for a new attending physician? Uh, how much lower do your payments start out as if you're under a graduated payment structure? Um, a graded premium structure will be cheaper by a good 30 to 60 percent. Uh, it's there's definitely an argument in favor of a graded premium or a graduated premium where you, you pay as little as you can, you, you buy the time and you kind of, if you do the analysis, the break-even point is somewhere between 15 to 17 years. So there's definitely a very strong argument in favor of starting with a graded premium, becoming financially independent, and by the time you reach that break-even point, canceling your policy. But uh, graded premiums are available to almost everyone um, up to the age of 45. Um, a Guardian's, Guardian in particular is the company that issues graded premiums, but the cutoff on that is 45. But um, I'm a proponent of graded premiums, again, because majority of my business is uh, from residents and fellows, and a budget is a big concern of theirs. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I think that's really attractive for somebody who's a super saver too. I mean, these people who may be financially independent at 45, uh, all they ever do is pay the cheap premiums. They're not around for the expensive years of the premiums. So the graduated premiums can really work out well for them. For, for those who are just tuning in now, I'm speaking with Bob Bayani. He's our sponsor this month in the Facebook group. Uh, you can find him at, at drdisabilityquotes.com. Our next question comes from Omar. If we have a current disability policy, will you review it and give recommendations? Absolutely. Um, matter of fact, today I had someone approach me from uh, the Facebook group who had me look at his policy and give him an opinion. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, just because you're approaching us for a review does not mean we're going to put any kind of a hard sell on you to change the policy. Uh, we'll be more than happy to review it, give you some advice. Um, you know, often uh, it's a good idea to get your policy reviewed because I've run into some policies that are, I, I ran into a principal policy that just did not have the own occupation or regular occupation writer, as they call it. Um, another broker, you know, th these, these type of mistakes occur from brokers that do not specialize in dealing with physicians. Uh, they happen to do eight or 10 physicians a year that just truly don't understand what writer should go into the policy and so forth. So absolutely, I would welcome the opportunity to um, review any policies and, and give you advice in terms of uh, um, you know, how the policy is set up. As a, as a general rule of thumb, it never pays to replace a policy that was set up two, three, five, ten years ago, because you're, you're no longer that younger age. Um, you know, now tell me you have a policy with modifications and surcharges because of pre-existing medical history. That may warrant a second look, but uh, under ordinary circumstances, um, I try to refrain from replacements. Uh, but again, we, we do reviews all the time. Do, do you often recommend an additional policy on top of the one they have? Uh, only if it is absolutely necessary. We only recommend uh, a disability policy, a second disability policy for a very high earner who is truly concerned about income replacement is the only, um, uh, you know, the source of that is, is the head of head of the household is the only source of income in the family um, it, it, under special circumstances, not as a rule. What about somebody that bought a policy that's not true own occupation? Say somebody bought a policy from Northwestern Mutual five or six years ago, kind of realized their mistake. At this point, is it worth paying a higher premium to get a true own oc definition? Or are you better off sticking with what you have, maybe adding a small policy on top of it, et cetera? You know, James, um, I would, I would, I would, I would go with the latter, you know, adding a smaller policy, if and only if there are medical issues that will prevent you from qualifying for a new policy. What I have seen of Northwestern policies is that these policies are priced anywhere from 30 to 50 percent higher than what every other company is charging. Plus, they're graded premiums that cannot even be converted to a level premium. So when you combine all of those factors um, and compare the pricing of these Northwestern policies to what's available in the open market, in I would say 98% of my cases, I'm able, able to deliver, if anything, savings. Uh, I, I'm able to add the true and occupation rider. Um, Northwestern has a residual rider that kicks in at 50% loss of income, whereas your traditional residual rider kicks in at 15% loss of income. So I'm able to enhance the policy and still save Northwestern policyholders money. The only time that strategy doesn't work is if the client has developed some sort of a chronic medical diagnosis since they bought the policy and I cannot get them a clean policy from a new company. Plus, then they don't have to worry about getting sold a whole life policy either. Yes, they, you know, Northwestern, their entire MO is they use disability insurance as a gateway product. Their, uh, their designs are, are not to give you the best disability policy, but is to get their foot in the door so that they can pitch you whole life. Um, one of your readers last year contacted me, 33-year-old ER physician in Miami, single, no children, no dependents, nothing. And um, she asked me to evaluate her uh, disability policy from Northwestern. And then she showed me this policy that the broker sold her 
a month after she became an attending, $3,000 a month whole life premium. She had paid close to $72,000 over a two-year period for a whole life policy that she did not even need. Um, and, and when I asked her, why did you buy this policy? She told me it was sold to me as a retirement plan. I said, a retirement plan is a retirement plan. <laughs> a whole, whole life insurance is not a retirement plan. And I without hesitation, um, had her replace it with a term policy. But that is something that I, I just truly do not appreciate, um, you know, about Northwestern. It's a culture. It, 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 they have a culture of, of um, you know, thinking of their own selves and, and products over clients. Yeah. All right, let's take the next question. For those just tuning in, we're talking with Bob Bayani of DrDisabilityQuotes.com. This one's from Parshva. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize if I'm not. Is it possible to remove temporary pre-existing conditions from a disability policy after being treated for it? And I would take that insofar also to discuss pre-existing bad habits like I've got, like rock climbing and scuba diving. And, and when can you get those off your policy? Um, yeah, so we very frequently end up uh, getting policies with exclusions. Today morning, I had a, a policy that came down uh, with, uh, with, well, this is a very interesting case. I'll tell you about it. So he had arthritis of the left knee and the insurance company came back and gave him an exclusion for the left knee, gave him a blanket arthritis exclusion. I mean, his entire body, wherever arthritis could pop up 10, 15, 20 years from now, wouldn't have been covered. They gave him a musculoskeletal disease exclusion. And I, I, the minute I saw that, I just laughed. I picked up the phone, I called the director of underwriting and I asked her to explain the actions of the underwriter and the outcome quite simply was, Bob, we're wrong. We're gonna give him a left knee exclusion. We're gonna take all the rest of the exclusions off. Now that's as far as negotiating a modified outcome at the point of application. But let's say you end up with an exclusion to begin with. Um, you've, gotta, you've gotta take into consideration, is this exclusion permanent or is it reviewable? So if you have a reviewable ex exclusion, then what we do is we put your name in a database and set a two-year uh, uh, time period to contact you to ask you questions about that pre-existing medical history. Let's say you were an SSRIs during med school. Uh, and, and now that you became an attending, you've been off of SSRIs for two or three years. There's absolutely no reason that mental nervous exclusion should be on your policy. Uh, we should appeal it. And I, I last year I filed 10 successful appeals um, and, and had exclusions removed. So absolutely. So if someone like yourself who is, um, who is actively mountain climbing, uh, it's, it's tough to go back to the insurance company and ask them to take that off because you're still mountain climbing. But if you were mountain climbing, but now that you became an attending and you just don't have the time to do it anymore and you haven't done it in a year or two, please, I mean, contact your broker, tell them to file an appeal, tell them to get that removed. And if you do start climbing again, there's no consequence. Um, so, so every ex exclusion must be questioned and reviewed um, um, you know, for appeals. Uh, and and it, we, we spend a considerable amount of time representing applications for appeals um, and successful ones. And now, there are instances when we will talk to a client and will clearly see that their health has either deteriorated or there's been absolutely no improvement and we'll advise them not to f file an appeal because it'd be a waste. Uh, but uh, un under most circumstances, what I've noticed is that uh, physicians tend to get healthier as they become attendings, um, you know, compared to med school and residency, which definitely opens the door for them to file appeals on such exclusions. Now, I guess if I was on the other end of an appeal, if I worked at an insurance company and come, someone came to me and said that we want to take off the exclusion for scuba diving, I guess I'd say, well, why? If you're not scuba diving, you're obviously not going to get disabled scuba diving. So why should we have to take that that exclusion away. Do you ever get that well, sort of feedback from them? You know, we, we, no, we don't because we don't, we don't put up with those type of, you know, we, 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 we work in our client's best interest. 
as truly independent brokers, we um, are committed to our clients, not to the insurance company. So if anyone would have the audacity to say something like that to me, I'd argue them, well, then why is the exclusion there in the first place? You know, why have an exclusion if you're not, you know, if the, if the person's not scuba diving? Um, so no, they generally tend not to do that. Now, there's one other thing that I want to mention to you about exclusions and appeals. Uh, every insurance disability insurance policy has a uh, two-year time period, which insurance companies call a short claim period. The biggest fear an insurance company has is someone filing a claim within two years of buying a policy. So typically what ends up happening is once the policy goes past the two years, the insurance companies are a lot more relaxed about that risk. And they tend to be a lot more lenient in terms of viewing appeals. So up, it, it, to, to remove exclusions, it's not as hard as one would think and insurance companies are not as um, um, you know, apt not to remove them because they realize that if this applicant went to another insurance company, odds are they're gonna get a policy without an exclusion. So they're mindful of that also. What about avoiding the situation in the first place? If you have a medical problem, you don't have disability insurance yet, what is the strategy to acquiring disability coverage without getting a denial? Because once you get a denial, it's harder to get coverage in the future. So how do, how do you work for somebody that has some issue before they've ever bought insurance? We, we get those all the time. And what I like to do is rather than without thinking, put in an application and, and risk a denial on their record, what I will do is I'll gather up their information and anonymously send it to underwriters and, and get feedback from underwriters as to, um, you know, and, and I won't go to one company, I'll go to five of them and get a general consensus. Because often what we see is that you've got one insurance company that is very risk averse to particular condition, but then you've got another insurance company whose manual is quite a bit different than company A, we'll turn around and say, sure, we'll cover this guy. It's not a problem. Uh, we may give him a modification at onset, but we'll let him, we'll let him appeal it to a, a better contract. But pre-screening is very critical. I think pre, if, you, if a broker does his job by pre-screening, you, you would end up, um, you would end up uh, avoiding a decline on your record. What, uh, how often do you think that happens to you when, when they come in and they've got some issue and you shop it around and you can't find anybody to cover them? Uh, is that frequent? Does that not happen? You know, you'll be surprised that insurance companies generally, you know, the way they manage risk is um, exclusions, right? So if they see some sort of pre-existing medical history that they can, they can use an exclusion um, and, and cover, you know, the rest of your body, um, they'll do it. Um, so they'll, they'll use exclusions. They'll use modifications. So the way they modify a policy is typically your average policy will pay you up to 865. Well, they'll take that time period and turn it into a 10-year payout. So they, they can limit their risk and still insure someone that is not healthy. Um, so, so I'll give you a perfect example. I had someone, you know, who had a BMI of 38, uh, you know, was on a CPAP machine for sleep apnea, had moderate sleep apnea, you know, was significantly overweight. And the advice I gave her is I said, look, no company is ever going to give you a clean cut policy at onset. So let's, let's employ this strategy. Let's get your foot in the door with a five or a 10 year benefit period. And then as you progress in your career, you lose the weight, your sleep apnea gets better. We can go back and file an appeal and, and get you those full benefits. But pre-screening is really um, you know, key. Now, there are some instances, um, you know, chronic hepatitis B um, is one example that I've run into recently where the insurance company simply will not consider you. Um, so that's when we advise clients to, you know, save up as much as they can and self-insure uh, and possibly use a guaranteed issue policy that may, that may be available from their residency program, group long-term disability uh, policies that, that they could potentially get from their employers. We try to think of ways and means um, to, to get them covered it, it, with a reasonable premium. Uh, if it's something that the, in, a traditional insurance company will simply not agree to take on. Speaking of group insurance policies, I mean, these can be dramatically cheaper than buying a, a portable individual 
disability insurance policy. I mean, I think the one that I was looking at from my uh, partnership, it was maybe 1% of the benefit was what it was costing me to buy it. Whereas a uh, individual policy was four or 5%. I mean, it was literally four or five times the price. Now, obviously the definition of disability wasn't as strong um, and uh, it didn't have level premiums either. But how do you weigh those factors for somebody when they're looking at, at you know, a dramatically cheaper group policy that they're eligible for? Yeah, uh, a group policy, you know, uh, traditionally a, a group policy is something you wouldn't even pay for. A majority of your employers would pay for the group policy for you. However, there, there are certain disadvantages with group policies. Group policies, number one, are not true own occupation. And if they are own occupation, they have own occupation and not working language in it. So that is something that you need to be mindful of because what you don't want an insurance company to do is say, well, because you can't do surgery, we'll go practice telemedicine. So, so that's the type of thing um, that you would encounter in a group policy where the, the bar to qualify for disability is significantly higher than a true own occupation private policy. Second uh, point that I would make is that a group policy um, is a certificate. You have no rights of ownership in that policy. So if you leave that employer, uh, you effectively are left with no coverage. You have no conversion COBRA privileges with a group policy. Um, one other factor that, that a lot of your re uh, readers may not be aware of is that group majority of the group policies uh, from institutions are issued under ERISA law. ERISA is a federal law um, that, that um, you know, oversees group disability policies. The problem with the ERISA law is, uh, or, or group policies that are issued under ERISA law is that if the insurance company denies your claim and a group policy, the only recourse you have is to hire an attorney out of pocket, sue the insurance company in federal court. You're not even allowed a jury trial. Um, you're, uh, the, uh, the attorney is only allowed a summary presentation and the judge uh, gives out a summary judgment uh, without the presence of a plaintiff. And in a best case scenario, you're only able to recover what you should have been paid to begin with. You're not able to recover damages or attorney's fees. So, so the, 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 the odds are stacked against insureds when it comes to group policies. Uh, but then again, if an employer offers a group policy that is paid for, you cannot even opt out of it. Um, so, so having a group policy, the good news is it's free. Uh, but I wouldn't entirely depend on a group policy for my coverage. All right. For those just tuning in, we're talking with Bob Bayani. He's this month's Facebook group sponsor. He's an in, independent disability insurance agent and expert on disability insurance. Our next question is coming from Jason Kirk. He's been waiting very patiently to get this one answered. He asks about a, a laddering technique for policies, like a lot of people do with their term life insurance. Is that effective to ladder policies for disability insurance? Um, I have not traditionally heard of the laddering concept in disability insurance. Um, what I have heard of is layering. And layering is only used when you want to go above the traditional maximum of a policy. So I don't see any particular benefit to laddering a policy when you're simply able to call me and ask me for a reduction in the size of the policy. Uh, what I see happening with laddering disability policies is you end up paying two sets of policy fees, uh, possibly higher premiums of one company compared to another. Um, but layering uh, is a strategy that I recommend to very high earners for someone looking for coverage in excess of the traditional limit of 20,000 a month, as we discussed previously. Um, but um, again, if there is something in particular that uh, this individual has in mind, um, perhaps they can, they can email me and, and I'll be more than happy to look into it deeper. Um, but for someone who just wants 12 or $15,000 of coverage a month, no sense in buying more than one policy. You just buy one big policy. One big policy. The, the more you buy, the cheaper it gets and from one company. Okay. I, I see a one word question on here from Alex Brown. Increase. I have no idea what you're asking, Alex. So you're going to need to type another question if you want us to answer that one. Um, but otherwise, I think we've answered all the disability insurance related questions that we got tonight. 
you have other questions, you can obviously always email me and, uh, and I'll try to get them answered or post them here in the Facebook group. Uh, Bob is also available to answer your questions. He said he'll review your policies you already have. If you would just like a second opinion, if you'd like a review, if you need coverage, I'd encourage you to get it now. People put this off too long and sometimes they put it off too late. I can remember um, uh, that I uh, had a residency classmate who was biking to work every day. And, uh, you know, he's on the trauma service and the trauma surgeon, the uh, upper level resident kept telling him, if you keep biking into work, I'm going to put a chest tube in you. And sure enough, he got hit. He came in unconscious. She put a chest tube in him. And luckily he had a full recovery. But, uh, you know, it really does happen to residents. Residents do get disabled. So the most important thing is to get a policy. Uh, Alex, I'm having trouble seeing your question. I know it's in here. Um, but for whatever reason, this is not letting me see it. Let me see if I can scroll scroll and find it here. All right, here we got. Uh, I do not see it, Alex. All I see is that one. So if you want to ask it again, I'll, I'll try to take a look at it. But I do not see another question from you anywhere in here. So maybe it didn't didn't come through for some reason. Sarah, you're very welcome. This is fun to do these Facebook lives and see you guys out there and and let all our flubs go go live, you know? <clears throat> There's no editing when we do these Facebook Lives. Um, but thank you so much to those of you who are on today and for, uh, for coming on. And for those who watch this later, I hope it was helpful to you. If you need disability insurance, call up an independent agent like Bob, get it, put it, get it in place. This is something you need to do early, early in your career. Basically, you walk out of med school, it's time to buy coverage. Um, Bob, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, and I think we'll wrap this up. We'll put it on YouTube and we'll, it'll be here in the Facebook group. Uh, and so hopefully uh, you meet a few new friends and clients from, from this conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. I okay. see Alex's question. Here it is, Alex. We're going to get your question in here at the end. He's saying on a 2 million term life policy, they want to increase the coverage by 10,000 each year automatically, but the premium increases about 10% or approximately $20 per year. I pay about $240 a month for this policy right now. Is it worth letting them increase it or is that a waste? Well, increasing the coverage on a $2 million term life policy by just $10,000 a year isn't much of an increase in, in coverage. I don't think I'd pay anything for that. I certainly wouldn't pay 10% more. I mean, if I was going to pay 10% more, I'd expect another $200,000 in coverage. So I think I'd turn that down. What do you, what do you think, Bob? Is that, I, is I that agree with you 100%. Yeah, that does not sound like a good idea. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not sure what company's offering that, but it, it sounds like a, like a money grab to me. Um, yes, uh, Nikhil, uh, there, there, there will be a copy of this in the Facebook group in just a minute. When I finish it, it basically posts in the Facebook group and you'll be able to watch it from the beginning. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope this was enjoyable and helpful. And we'll keep doing these. If you like them, send me some feedback and, and let us know. And, uh, and we'll try to keep doing them if, if they're helpful for you. Bob, good night. Thank you. Let's get back to your family. I know you stayed late from work for this. And, uh, and we'll get you going. My pleasure.